Today, for the sixth time, the Hertie Foundation awards the Eric Kendall Young Neuroscientist Prize. Eric Kendall is probably the world's best known neuroscientist, and he's here. Professor Kendall, again, it's an honor to talk to you. It's a pleasure to be here, and I think, in all fairness, to say that there are a significant number of neuroscientists working in this world. I don't think anyone can be picked out as being distinctive in his own right, but I am enjoying my career in neuroscience a great deal. Okay, we'll leave it like that. <laughs> I won't argue about that. This year, the Kendall Prize goes to Misha Arens, who is 38. Now, Googling you, I found a picture of yours where you have similar haircut <laughs> growing to the shoulders. Um, this made me wonder, at this age, at 38, what did you do then? I guess it was 1967. Well, I'd already finished with medical school. Uh, I had um, started doing research. I decided in medical school, where I had an elective period, that I really enjoyed doing research. Uh, and uh, at that point, I was primarily interested in memory storage. Um, and I had learned how to insert electrodes into single cells. And I thought that if I recorded from the hippocampus the structure that had just been shown by Brenda Miller and others to be important in memory storage, I would understand the mechanisms of memory storage. So I succeeded in doing this. It was technically a very difficult task. I was the first person to record from single cells in the hippocampus. And I found that they fired just like other cells. And I said to myself, well, you're a dope. This is not the way to think about the problem. Uh, uh, memory is not a single structure. It's activation of pathways that are important for storing memory. So you have to go and figure out a pathway that is important for memory st storage and study it. So I thought about this for a little while, and I said, well, maybe let's take the most elementary case. Let's take a reflex that can be modified by learning. So if I touch an animal at a certain point, it withdraws its limb, and with repeated stimulation, it habituates, so it no longer withdraws. But then if I scare it, the same weak stimulus would cause it to withdraw. So you have both habituation and what's called sensitization. You can even study classical conditioning. So I had that in a simple system, and I was now in a position to examine what happens in the neural circuit of a behavior when the behavior is modified, not only by learning, but by different kinds of learning. And I found that with habituation, the connections between the sensory neurons and the motor neurons got weaker. So after a while, the sensory neuron had no power over firing the motor neuron, and you had no behavior. If you scare the animal, you activated an arousal system that acted on this simple neural circuit, strengthened the connections between the sensory neuron and the motor neuron, so the sensory neurons would produce a more powerful withdrawal. So I had in elementary form some of the basic principles of learning and memory storage. Uh, then I looked at the difference between short-term memory and long-term memory. Short-term memory is you present the stimulus once or twice, and you get a behavioral change. Long-term memory, if you present it repeatedly, the change persists for days and even weeks. And I found that when that happens, you get an actual anatomical change. So if some, an animal is habituated, the connections between the sensory neurons and the motor neurons actually get weaker. Anatomically, they're smaller. If you scare the animal and sensitize it, the anatomical connections get bigger. So really, it was very nice to have a simple system we could work out some of the basic principles of learning and memory. And that got me really excited about working in the field. So um, post hoc, one could say you were already on the track to the Nobel Prize. Yes. Yes. The 38. I, I, I didn't have this in mind, but I was on to something very uh, productive scientifically through good fortune and a certain amount of you know, good taste. Uh, and I worked hard at it. Um, and I didn't have any prizes in mind, uh, but it was clear that the field found this very interesting and important, and that I was being invited to conferences and things like that, including to Stockholm. And Stockholm invites people to take a look-see 
whether what people say about them is oh. true or not. They invited mm -hmm. me a couple of times. I guess they must have been satisfied with me to see I wore a nice suit. Uh, and so finally I got a call. <laughs> it was yep. very funny, the call. The most important Jewish holiday is Yom Kippur. And uh, the telephone rang at 5.30 in the morning and the morning of Yom Kippur. So Denise gives me a push and saying, uh, Eric, uh, this is Stockholm calling. It must be for you, it's not for me. <laughs> <laughs> so I answered the phone and they told me you know, what had happened. And I didn't open my mouth for the next five minutes as he gave me instructions. And Denise thought there was something wrong with me because she'd never seen me quiet for so long. <laughs> And then, you know, after all, I explained to her what happened. Mm -hmm. And we uh, had to skip the synagogue for that day because the school, when it heard about this and it heard about it immediately, wanted to have a press conference. So I just went to the synagogue, said hello to my friends, and explained to them that I wouldn't be able to join them, and then headed off to Columbia, mm -hmm. where somehow they had contacted my students. My students came out and greeted me at the door. Ah. Uh -huh. uh, <laughs> The same guy, but now he was different. <laughs> Your interest in the brain started with Sigmund Freud, but you became a Nobel laureate because of your work on synapses, deep down in physiology. Now you just published a book, um, which is called The Disordered Mind, What Unusual Brains Tell Us About Ourselves. Is it wrong to say that you completed a circle, maybe? No, I actually like to think that there is connectivity between my work. Not necessarily consciously planned, but part of it is unconscious. And I think this gives a continuity to my work, which I've really enjoyed. So I sometimes find myself you know, revisiting problems that I worked on earlier, but on a different level. Either I have new techniques available that I didn't have earlier, or the problem has advanced. So I like sticking with a limited number of themes. Um, it's a little bit like the approach that I took to begin with. Uh, when I began to study learning and memory, you could try to go to a very sophisticated animal with a very sophisticated behavior and look at a very complex form of learning and try to analyze it. And I went to a simple animal that had a simple neural circuit for a simple behavior. It could be modified by learning and analyze that. And I think that was a good move. Now, lately I talked a lot to psychiatrists and reading your book with, um, in its approach to patients, in its point of view, in um, the described results and experiments, I think, as far as I can tell, it's on the forefront of psychiatry. So this made me wonder, is, isn't this a field of hidden expertise for you? Isn't this... Um, maybe some kind of art, uh, no, some kind of love, like art, psychiatry? I, oh, absolutely. Uh, I like psychiatry very much. I don't think the field is um, using its potential power as aggressively as it might. Uh, I think the quality of a lot of the science being done is not outstanding. Uh, and I'm trying to encourage, you know, good people to move in and do more serious research. But it's coming along. Certainly, they, you know, both psychiatrists are aware that you need controls and you need a significant number of people for most studies. So I think it's, it's coming along. Now, the last time I read about your lab was last month. And it was a study about CPEP3 mm -hmm. um, and its effect on synapses. They grow weaker without CPEB3. Um, it was a mouse study, but when I talked to you, Ms. Mr. Kendall, was there one human being as a subject involved? I'm sorry, was there one human being as a subject involved? You? Yes. Uh, I find that when I do similar things that I recommend for these mice, uh, <laughs> I also do better. So uh, I think the strengthening of connections occurs because there's a hormone released from bone called osteocalcin. When animals move around, they move their bones, they release this osteocalcin, and it strengthens connections between neurons in the brain. 
and age-related memory loss is associated with a decrease of osteocalcin. So if you can get an animal to walk around more, exercise its bones more, so the bones become stronger, release more osteocalcin, you can reverse age-related memory loss. And although this has not been shown rigorously in clinical studies, I certainly have increased the amount I walk now. And I think, you know, my general impression is from my friends whom I've also encouraged to do this, that their memory is holding up a little bit better than it did before. Do you still play tennis? Of course I play tennis. I wish I could play better. Uh, what was really disappointing is my tennis improves mostly in the month of August. I go on vacation uh, in the month of August and I play on fantastic uh, clay courts at Oliver's. And he is a terrific pro up there with whom I've been working, you know, for, let's say, one or two days a week for the four weeks that I'm on vacation. And it always helped my game a great deal. For some stupid reason, he didn't bring this pro back and I had no lessons this summer, so I'm very worried about the season. Oh. <laughs> <laughs> um, now, last time we talked, um, it was about social nationalism in Germany and mm. in, in, in Austria, um, how you fled from Vienna, how my father was on the other side being a Nazi. Um, now, ten years after, the world has grown probably much darker with all those nationalism on the rise in Europe and this special president you have in the States. What does this do to you as a political person? Well, I mean, uh, Trump is a disaster, but he's not a Nazi. No, he isn't. This, was, this uh, wasn't a client from my yeah, side. Yeah, yeah, yeah. Uh, also, um, I think one has to point out, uh, I don't want to defend the United States. I think Trump is a, is a very poor choice. Um, but there are protective measures in a great democracy, like the United States or England, um, that limit the power of any single person. So I, you know, Trump can and will do damage, but it'll be restricted and reversible. So you're optimistic about the states? I'm very optimistic. Having lived in Europe when Hitler was here, let me tell you, <laughs> I'm extremely optimistic about the states. And what, states are a wonderful place to live. And what do you think about Europe? I'm not sufficiently well enough informed about Europe, but it doesn't look great to me. It looks uneven and, you know, worrisome like it often is. Mm. Professor Kandel, thank you very much for this talk. Pleasure. Thank you for having me.